The Walking Dead has a spin-off series now. This time, the highly anticipated character Rick finally makes an appearance, because this show has a new storyline. Even if you haven't watched The Walking Dead, it won't affect your understanding of the plot. Six years ago, Rick personally blew up a bridge to block the zombies. His companions thought he perished in the fire, and his wife Kathy was deeply saddened. Actually Rick didn't die, he was rescued by a group. This group, consisting of thousands of people, protects a well-functioning, hidden city with a population of hundreds of thousands. Why it is called a hidden city is, because they prioritize safety and confidentiality. Once you enter the city, there's no chance of leaving, so outsiders like Rick who were saved, are responsible for hunting and killing zombies. They are called consignees. Consignees can become official citizens of the city, after working in the suburbs for a few years, living a normal life away from zombies. However, Rick doesn't want citizenship, he just wants an opportunity to escape, and reunite with his family. During a hunting mission, Rick didn't hesitate to sever his left hand, which was handcuffed. In order to escape, he evaded the zombies and hid in the woods, disinfecting his severed arm in flames, but the soldiers who caught up with him quickly stunned him. In reality, Rick has repeatedly escaped, and violated the rules. He should be sentenced to death as a warning to the public, while the leader of the military, Okafor, greatly admires Rick and has been trying to convince him to join the army. Unfortunately, Rick has always wanted to leave this place. He stubbornly holds his position as a consignee. He constantly searches for opportunities to escape. There's no escape for the living. I left the uniform in your apartment. Upon hearing this, Rick felt somewhat confused. Could it be that he really cannot escape from this cage? One day, Rick's friend Eric came to talk to him. Excitedly, Eric mentioned that he was about to leave the suburbs. He would become a new citizen of the hidden city. Moreover, he was promoted to the position of deputy manager of water and electricity in District 3. In fact, for most ordinary people, the hidden city is safe and comfortable. It is already the best place to live in the post-apocalyptic world. Upon learning about the invitation from Okafor, Eric urged Rick to join the military. After all, soldiers have higher privileges than consignees. This statement awakened Rick. Perhaps joining the military would make it easier for him to escape. So Rick accepted Okafor's invitation, and officially joined the Civic Republic military. Okafor even provided him with a prosthetic limb. In the following time, Rick trained and went on missions with the military. After a particular mission, Okafor left Rick to have a conversation with a female soldier named Thorn. He wanted to groom both of them for leadership positions within the Civic Republic military. Upon hearing this, Rick expressed, I tried to escape four times. Mm -hmm. I did this. I tried to kill you. Okafor explained that he needs to cultivate his own influence within the military for reform purposes, so he wants to promote both of them to squad commanders. Once Rick and Thorne gradually ascend, they will receive classified briefings from the secret squad, knowing secrets unknown to the majority of citizens. Why do you even think I'm going to go along with all of this? Because I believe if either one of you had a chance to save the world, you would. Thorne once served in the South African Navy and has no attachments or obligations. Joining Okafor is the best choice for her. She knows that Rick wants to escape, but Okafor isn't easily fooled. Rick agreed to the promotion proposal. Earlier, the military discovered two cities, Portland and Omaha. The hidden city formed an alliance with them without revealing its own location. This is also the greatest advantage of the hidden city. In the afternoon, Major General Beal of the Civic Republic military came to talk to Rick. He wanted to know if Okafor's sudden promotion had another agenda. He also wanted to understand why Rick, who had been trying to escape, agreed to join the military. Rick remained tight-lipped about it. He is not interested in the power struggles within the Civic Republic military. He just wants to find a way to escape as soon as possible. In the following time, Rick followed orders and diligently completed the tasks assigned by Okafor. As he gained more information, Rick discovered the weak points of the city. On that day, he arranged to meet Eric in the city. He took out a map of the city's sewer system. Rick wanted to know where the tunnel beneath the maintenance hole led to. Eric was a senior level water and power personnel and naturally had knowledge about the sewer system. He whispered to Rick that the tunnel led to the east and there was a gate at a junction one mile away. I 100% wouldn't tell you that the code to open is 4399. Eric is indeed a considerate person. Although he gave up his own freedom, he understands Rick's desire to escape. After waiting for some time, Rick finally found a suitable opportunity. That night, he boarded a helicopter to carry out an undercover mission at the True Lock chemical plant. He was tasked with recovering resources from the abandoned chemical plant. Rick found a zombie corpse that had a similar build to his own. He then severed its left hand. He hung his military ID around its neck. 
Okafor said that no living person can escape from here, so he decided to stage his own death scene. Rick placed a timed bomb near the gas truck, then pried open the saw manhole cover and entered. All he had to do next was to detonate the bomb to destroy the appearance of the corpse, and then he could escape through the saw. Unexpectedly, before Rick could take action, a human girl suddenly appeared ahead. Rick paused his actions and rushed into the pile of zombies to protect the girl. Unexpectedly, the commotion attracted Thorn. Rick didn't want to miss this perfect opportunity and begged Thorn for help. He asked her to pretend she hadn't seen anything and let him escape. I am helping you. He would have found you. And whoever you're running to. Thorn's meaning is very clear. Okafor knows all the information about Rick. Even if you run, they can still capture you because the Civic Republic military never allows anyone who knows the location of the hidden city to leave alive. Upon hearing this, Rick had no choice but to give up this opportunity. Late at night, he quietly went to Okafor's room. What the hell do you know about me? Why did Thorne say that Okafor knew all the information about Rick? It turns out that when the Civic Republic military found Rick, they intercepted the message in a bottle he left for Kathy. Therefore, they knew the identity of Rick's wife. In addition, Okafor also deduced that Rick had a daughter through the pictures on his phone. Since they knew her appearance and name, why would they have trouble finding Kathy's location? Okafor was certain that Rick would compromise for his family. Rick rushed forward and started punching and kicking Okafor. This isn't everything! You don't get to choose for the world! You don't get to choose for me! Rick angrily said, You're willing to live for this city, because you have nothing else besides your duty. This struck a nerve with Okafor. He abruptly stood up and lunged at Rick. He said, you have no right to point fingers at me. Okafor, in order to prevent the spread of zombies, led the Air Force to bomb two cities. When it was time to bomb Philadelphia, his wife, who was also a Marine, intentionally tried to stop him. However, for the greater good, Okafor personally killed his wife and the remaining 4,000 people in Philadelphia. The sacrifice of a portion of the population resulted in the peace of tens of thousands of people. Okafor stated, in the apocalypse, Many choices are beyond your control. Unexpectedly, in the next second, Rick launched a sudden attack. Both of them pointed their weapons at each other. Finally, Rick gave up resistance and placed his head in front of the barrel. If you don't let me go, just shoot me, Rick said. However, Okafor put away his weapon. He told Rick that if he stayed here, he would actually be fighting for his family without a safe environment. What's the use of finding your wife and child? Rick, after listening, quiet down. Then Okafor assigned him a task. For the next 12 months, Rick and Thorne would be reassigned to logistics. They are responsible for transforming a university in Cascades into an advanced operating base, preparing for frontline battles. One year later, all high-ranking citizens and commanders of the Civic Republic military will gather there for a summit. By then, Rick and Thorne will become project leaders for the transition team. This will be their starting point to infiltrate the higher ranks and pave the way for power. Yet, Rick doesn't want power. I don't want power. That's the thing. You already have it. If Okafor's words made Rick hesitate, the news brought by Thorne completely changed his mindset. Thorne rushed into Rick's dormitory and turned on the television. From the news report, it is known that Omaha failed to attend the Alliance meeting in Portland as scheduled. Major General Beale immediately led his team to investigate and confirmed that Omaha has fallen. This is one of the last three cities remaining on the American continent. Preliminary investigations indicate that the collapse was caused by the failure of the surrounding barriers. In the following weeks, the Civic Republic military will investigate the situation to determine if the collapse was caused by zombies. But Thorne knows that zombies are not capable of such an act, and the collapse of the barriers was intentional. Furthermore, she told Rick that the little girl they saved at the factory that night is a resident of Omaha. She was covered in blood to mask her scent. She managed to escape Omaha and accidentally stumbled upon the hidden city. Thorne said all of this to make Rick understand that he needs to strive to climb up the ranks, become stronger, and protect the people he wants to protect. Otherwise, if they encounter an unexpected event like Omaha one day, they wouldn't even know how they died. Rick stared at the TV screen and made up his mind. He decided to temporarily forget the past and wholeheartedly focus on the university renovation task. Rick even burned the letter he wrote to his wife. He worked like a machine, constantly in motion, only recalling the past in his dreams. On this day, he took Okafor to check the progress of the renovation. Okafor noticed that Rick had become much calmer. Rick said that these past few days, he had been thinking about a night from his childhood. He was only seven years old that year, when he woke up thirsty in the middle of the night. To his surprise, he saw his family's farm engulfed in flames, and his father quickly arrived at the scene. His father comforted Rick, 
telling him not to be afraid, and that the flames were for the next season's bountiful harvest, providing nutrients for the crops on the farm. Although the scene before them seemed like the end of the world, it was actually a new beginning. Later, it turned out that what his father said was true. They didn't perish in the fire. They rebuilt their home, forgot their sorrows, and had a bountiful harvest the following year. It wasn't until many years later, after his father's death, that Rick learned the truth from his mother. It turned out that the fire was not an accident. The farm was on the verge of bankruptcy, and his father intentionally set the fire to deceive insurance and save the farm. In the past, Rick had always resented his father's dishonesty in his heart, but now he finally understands the other person's actions. So he wants to join Okafor, even if the flames in his hands will cause harm to people. But the purpose of this fire is ultimately to save everyone. Okafor expresses his satisfaction, saying, I knew I didn't misjudge you, who would have known that in the next second? A miniature bomb pierced Okafor's abdomen, instantly tearing him apart. Immediately after, the helicopter also lost control and plummeted towards the ground. Fortunately, Rick and the soldier were unharmed. They had just crawled out of the cabin when a bomb exploded nearby. Rick was thrown several meters away. Before he could catch his breath and get up, a woman held a knife to his throat. She forcefully pulled off the person's mask, and both of them revealed astonished expressions. The one holding the knife turned out to be Kathy, his wife. Why is she showing up here? So, during the time when Rick went missing, what exactly happened to Kathy? Let's go back to the bridge explosion incident. Kathy didn't believe her husband would die, and through her relentless search, she discovered the clues Rick left behind, and she deduced that he was likely at Bridges Terminal. So Kathy embarked on a journey to find Rick. On the way, she rescued a couple trapped by zombies, and she escorted them back to their community. She had a conversation with the leader of that community, Ellie. Kathy wanted to borrow a horse from the community to expedite her journey, but Ellie wanted Kathy to stay. It was not only to express gratitude to Kathy, for saving her sister and brother-in-law, but also because the community needed strong individuals to join them, and Kathy was the ideal candidate to recruit. Upon hearing this, Kathy immediately refused, as she only wanted to find her husband as soon as possible, and reunite with her children in the Alexandria community. She had to go to Bridges Terminal to find someone. Upon hearing that Kathy wanted to go to the port, Ellie kindly reminded Kathy that it wasn't advisable to head north at the moment, as that area was the junction of three territories, which used to have millions of inhabitants, but now all those people had turned into zombies, and for some unknown reason, every year around this time, that group of zombies would move south, and then migrate north again after a few months, so Ellie suggested, you can stay with us for a while, and then resume your journey once the migration is over. Kathy knew that Ellie wanted to keep her by suggesting that. She pointed out the biggest issue in this community. Your sister and brother-in-law were trapped by zombies, yet the community refused to send help. Although Ellie argued that it was a matter of survival, they couldn't risk jeopardizing the safety of 200 people in the community. Kathy believed that in such a callous environment, it couldn't be called a community at all. Upon expressing her thoughts, she wanted to leave the place. Suddenly, a short man barged in. This person's name was Nat. He was very unhappy with Ellie's decision not to rescue their fellow community members, as the community was fully capable of rescuing the trapped individuals. If Ellie didn't make a change, he was ready to pack up and leave. After speaking for a while, he realized that the people trapped earlier that morning had returned. He rushed over and hugged his friends, and upon learning that Kathy had saved them, Nat disregarded the objections of the female leader, and was willing to offer her a horse. Nat also provided Kathy with a set of professional armor. Before departing, Kathy couldn't help but ask Nat, why do you choose to stay in this community? You deserve a better place. Nat couldn't help but self-mockingly say, perhaps it's because he is so cowardly that he is afraid to leave. After finishing his words, Nat gave Kathy a notebook, hoping that she would find her husband soon. Subsequently, Kathy set off towards the north, and she witnessed a horde of zombies nearly five miles wide. She pulled out a rocket launcher from her bag and fired. The explosion sound attracted the attention of the zombie horde. This move indeed worked. Kathy was preparing to fire a second shot. A zombie engulfed in flames, carrying a gasoline canister, approached. It didn't go far before it exploded entirely, and the splattering limbs knocked Kathy off her horse. The intense explosion sound caused the zombies to turn their heads. They started moving their bodies closer to Kathy, and Kathy drew her knife. Preparing for a fight, a distant explosion sounded, and two hillsides ignited purple flames. The nearby horde was attracted to the firelight just like the parting of the Red Sea, dispersing to both sides. It turned out to be Nat and the couple coming to support. They couldn't forget Kathy's question before she left. They made up their minds to break free from the community, and apart from the three of them, some others who had long been dissatisfied with the community rules joined. 
In the evening, the group gathered around the campfire and chatted. Through this conversation, we can learn that Nat is actually a weapon expert and craftsman, and he is almost the community's greatest security. That's why he can convince his companions, and the purple smoke bombs were made by his own hands. Kathy couldn't help but suggest to Nat and the others that after finding Rick, we can all return and live together in the Alexandria community. Kathy noticed that Ellie's sister was pregnant. It was too difficult for her to run around with a child. Kathy wanted to persuade her to return to the community with her husband. But that place didn't even rescue pregnant women. Una was determined not to go back. She decided to accompany Kathy in finding Rick first. The next day, the group passed through a small town. On the way, Nat shared his own story. He grew up with his mother and depended on each other for survival. He had never met his biological father. Nat was always bullied due to his small stature. He developed an antisocial personality. He vented his anger by setting things on fire. If nothing unexpected happened, he might have become an arsonist. Later, Nat met his stepfather. The man was frail and sickly. His stepfather needed his help wherever they went. In the feeling of being needed by someone, he rediscovered the meaning of life. He redirected his attention from destroying things to focusing on creating tools to aid his stepfather. As a result, he grew up to be a skilled craftsman. While Nat was halfway through his story, suddenly, the sound of a Civic Republic military helicopter came from above. The next moment, they dropped chlorine gas bombs towards the ground. Kathy's team of over 10 people was almost completely wiped out. As for why Civic Republic military would deploy gas bombs, it was because they had regulations, stating that any unfamiliar group approaching the Civic Republic without notification would be eliminated directly. Fortunately, Kathy and Nat didn't inhale enough gas to cause illness. However, Yuna's condition is very grim. The two of them, along with Yuna's brother-in-law, helped her into a roadside furniture store. Yuna foamed at the mouth and held onto Kathy. She urged Kathy not to continue taking risks and quickly returned to her child's side. Before Kathy could react, Nat also started experiencing difficulty breathing. He asked Kathy to go to the medical plaza behind for oxygen cylinders. Kathy quickly pulled herself together. She instructed her brother-in-law to tie up Yuna to prevent her from turning into a zombie after suffocating. After giving all the instructions, Kathy went alone to the pharmacy. She quickly returned to the furniture store with an oxygen cylinder in hand. By that time, Yuna had already turned into a full-fledged zombie. Kathy had no choice but to use her blade to send her off. Similarly, her brother-in-law also turned into a zombie. Kathy killed him with a single strike. Only Nat, who was hiding in a ring of fire, survived by luck. The tragic deaths of their two friends left Nat hopeless. She was right. <laughs> when you can, <laughs> you need to go home. He urged Kathy to return home as soon as possible. Your husband has been missing for so many years. Perhaps he has already died. Nevertheless, Kathy still holds on to hope. Due to the severe damage to their respiratory systems from the chlorine gas bombs, both of them need time to recover. For a long period of time, Kathy and Nat didn't leave them all. Fortunately, there was enough food there. The leaves outside turned green and then yellow. Their bodies finally returned to normal. Kathy didn't want Nat to accompany her on adventures anymore. She gave him a hand-drawn map. Let him go seek refuge in the Alexandria community. Unexpectedly, Nat refused Kathy's suggestion. He wanted to see if they could find Rick, whether this persistence had any meaning. And so, the two of them set off again with their luggage. Kathy even grabbed a zombie as a bag carrier. When they finally arrived at the bridge's terminal, they found no trace of any living person. Instead, there was a pile of charred corpses. Kathy checked each corpse, but there were no clues of Rick. Fear overwhelmed them. Even Kathy couldn't help but shed tears. Nat, in turn, comforted her. Don't give up hope. You can choose to believe that Rick is still alive. You can believe a little longer and still go home to your kids. Nat believed that, more than hope itself, a heart that believes in hope is more important. So, with Nat's careful persuasion, Kathy set off on her journey again. Unexpectedly, halfway through their journey, the familiar helicopter appeared once again. The anger of their fallen companions burned in their hearts. They decided to bring down the helicopter to avenge the deceased Yuna and her husband. Nat explosives killed Okafor. They also successfully took down the helicopter where Rick was. Kathy killed the Civic Republic military on board. Until she found Rick, the reunited pair had a lot to say. But more Civic Republic military were on their way. They didn't have time to escape. Rick reminds his wife, there will be Civic Republic military coming later. You must not reveal your identities. Just say you are passing refugees. Say we saw these soldiers being attacked. Rick didn't have time to explain more. Fortunately, Kathy believed him unconditionally. Just then, Nat caught up. Before Kathy could introduce them, Nat was shot by the surviving Civic Republic military soldiers. He was happy for Kathy before he died. It turns out in this cruel world, there is still hope.
Kathy didn't have time to mourn. She had to cooperate with Rick first. To see the approaching Civic Republic military, Kathy hands over everything she brought from the Alexandria community. To Rick, Rick then puts a car tanner into Nat's hand. After quickly setting up the scene, Kathy successfully poses as a refugee. She undergoes an interview with the Civic Republic military, and successfully becomes a junior consignee. Yet, within the jurisdiction of the Civic Republic military, Rick and Kathy can only meet privately. That day, the two of them hide in a garage together. Kathy finally has the opportunity to question, have you really been involved in harming innocent people with the Civic Republic military? Rick immediately denies it. He was also a consignee before, his daily job was to kill zombies. Kathy deeply despises the Civic Republic military. She wants to leave here as soon as possible. But Rick has escaped numerous times. He knows that it's difficult to escape from this place. He must follow Okafor's words. Find a way to change the Civic Republic military from within. Before parting ways, Rick hands Nat's lighter to Kathy. As a final memento. Meanwhile, Kathy climbs to a high point to overlook the entire base. She sees countless military vehicles and helicopters. She somewhat understands Rick's intention. The power of the Civic Republic military is not to be underestimated. Without finding a suitable plan, they won't be able to escape. On the other hand, Rick returns to the dormitory. He finds a woman sitting on a chair. That person is none other than junk girl Jadis. It turns out she has also become part of the Civic Republic military. After seeing Kathy's interview recording, she knows that Rick and Kathy concealed their identities and the truth in the woods, but Jadis has no intention of exposing them. Instead, she came to warn Rick, if the two of you want to escape, it will endanger the friends and family in the Alexandria community. Your loved ones will all die. After all, Jadis' hands are stained with blood. She doesn't care about killing a few more people. So, I have to ask you this question. Rick, what the fuck are you doing? When Rick first joined the Civic Republic military, Jadis had been waiting here for days. She immediately started talking to Rick. From their conversation, it can be known. Jadis had been in contact with the Civic Republic military for a long time. It is well known. In the post-apocalyptic world, human resources are the scarcest. So Jadis took advantage of this and traded with the Civic Republic military. She would regularly provide survivors to the military in exchange for usable supplies. After the bridge explosion incident, it was Jadis who contacted the helicopter and brought Rick to the Civic Republic military's territory. Jadis' population trading scheme successfully helped her bypass the consignee service phase and directly infiltrate the Civic Republic military. She wanted to join forces with Rick and infiltrate the higher ranks because the Civic Republic has a long-term plan of 500 years. It is the only large community capable of rebuilding human civilization. However, Rick blames Jadis for bringing him to a place he cannot escape from. The time goes back a few hours. Thorne is grieving for Okafor's death, but Rick comes to her for help. He hopes Thorne can use her position as a vice officer to leave Kathy here for service. Rick didn't explicitly mention Kathy's identity. He only mentioned that this survivor saved his life. Although this request was somewhat odd, but Thorne still agreed. When Rick returned to the dormitory, he saw Jadis. Jadis discovered that Kathy had joined the Civic Republic military. She was afraid that the other party's identity would be exposed, which would lead the Civic Republic military to investigate Rick's past, and as the recommender, she would certainly be punished as well. That's why she threatened Rick and Kathy not to escape, and Jadis had a backup plan. She had already prepared all the information about Rick. If he dared to act against her, those files would be made public. The Civic Republic military, who highly valued secrecy, would surely kill all the people close to Rick. In the past few years, Jadis had never threatened Rick like this before, because she understood Rick couldn't escape on his own. But after Kathy arrived, the situation was different. Jadis had to be on constant guard against these two. On Kathy's side, she tried to keep a low profile as much as possible. She was busy clearing zombies on the outskirts of the city every day. On this day, a woman named Cleo approached her for a conversation. She wanted to test Kathy's level of training. Suddenly, there was an explosion sound in the distance. Cleo explained that, this is the Civic Republic military deploying disruption grenades. The purpose is to disperse the nearby zombie groups. In fact, from this, we can see, Cleo is skilled at gathering information, and she has a keen eye. She noticed that Kathy is a capable person, so she wants to align herself with Kathy. While Cleo is talking, she is clearing the pile of corpses. Unexpectedly, there are a few partially dead zombies mixed in. The situation becomes critical. Kathy instantly kills two zombies. Cleo sees this scene. She becomes even more convinced that Kathy is extraordinary. Shortly after, Major General Beale holds a funeral for Okafor. He specifically mentions during the ceremony. Several years ago, Okafor was our enemy, but he chose to join the Civic Republic military and became a respected hero. 
Beale's words are clearly a reminder to Rick to stand on the right side. In fact, Beale is well aware Okafor's purpose in cultivating loyal followers. He also knows that Rick and Thorne are talented and useful, but Beale doesn't trust Rick. He believes Thorne is a more worthy candidate for cultivation. That's why he promoted her to commander. Although Thorne is still officially an officer, she already has the authority of a lieutenant officer. Beale has shared more information with her, including the squad briefing mentioned by Okafor. Thorne approaches Rick for a conversation, asking him to take over logistics at the frontline base. At the same time, Thorne mentions that Beale inquired about Kathy, considering there are over 17,000 people in the army. But Beale specifically noticed Kathy. Thorne feels that things aren't that simple. She wants Rick to be open with her. After all, she did save Kathy at the risk of her own life. Because of her respect for Rick, Thorne wants to make sure it won't affect her. Rick immediately assures that Kathy won't cause any trouble. But he is well aware, the escape plan needs to be advanced. Rick takes out a map. He draws an escape route along the river. He also thoughtfully marks the time of disruption grenade launches. During her lunch break, he discreetly hands the note to Kathy. He also prepares the body of a black woman by the river. In the evening, Kathy follows the instructions on the note. She finds a detailed map from the storage cabinet. Soon after, the sound of disruption grenades exploding is heard outside. This indicates that the Civic Republic military are busy dealing with the zombies. It's the best opportunity for them to escape. Kathy quickly arrives at the reed bed. A body similar in size to hers is floating in the river. The small boat that Rick had hidden in advance is nearby. There's also a letter on it. Rick writes, hoping that Kathy will leave alone. He needs to stay behind and hold the line to prevent loved ones from being hunted down. The next day, Rick explains the situation to Jadis. He hopes she will cover for Kathy's feigned death plan. After some hesitation, Jadis agrees, because only by helping Kathy leave will Rick be willing to stay. Nevertheless, what surprises both of them is, Kathy didn't leave either. She showcased her zombie hunting skills, attracting onlookers. Thorne noticed this. This woman will definitely cause trouble. Shortly after, Rick found Kathy as well. He asked her why she came back. The reason was simple. Kathy believed Rick wasn't qualified to make decisions for her. She wanted everyone to leave together. That was her purpose for this journey. On the other side, Thorne wanted to test Kathy personally. She inquired about the details of the plane crash in the woods. Kathy didn't want to answer. Thorne bluntly stated that someone like Kathy, an A-class individual, she shouldn't have been brought in originally. Rick sensed that Thorne had murderous intent. He immediately drew his gun to alert. Fortunately, Thorne didn't make a move. Instead, she gave Kathy an opportunity to let her participate in the cleanup operation at Cascadia Base. The base used to be just an ordinary university, until Okafor led the transformation project, intending to turn it into a center of power. In a few days, important members of the military high command and frontline units will come here for a summit. So ensuring the base's security is a top priority for the Civic Republic military. The task Thorne issued this time is to repair the obvious gaps in the surrounding fence and deal with the 200-plus zombies near the gaps. Thorne plans to place a bomb 100 steps away from the gap to kill the horde of zombies. The drone will launch explosives to create scattered explosions. The entire mission must be kept low profile. Therefore, the soldiers can only use cold weapons and air guns. As for Kathy, she only needs to handle the aftermath. However, during the subsequent battle, Kathy disregarded Thorne's orders. She took it upon herself to push the stalled bomb cart towards the horde of zombies. Rick quickly rushed forward to help. The two of them cooperated seamlessly. They blew up a pile of zombies. They crouched and hid in the nearby bushes. Kathy believed it was the perfect opportunity to escape, but Rick was afraid of endangering their loved ones. He insisted on taking her back to the battlefield. Meanwhile, Thorne realized that Kathy was uncontrollable. She quietly raised her gun and aimed at Kathy. In a critical moment, Rick grabbed a zombie to block Thorne's line of sight. Thorne had to give up shooting. At night, Thorne found Rick. She informed him that their zombie cleanup had been successful. Beale is likely to promote you. You should stay away from Kathy to avoid suspicion. Meanwhile, Jandis deliberately came over to show herself. She wanted Kathy to see her. As a reminder for Kathy not to try to escape, Rick pulled Kathy aside. He wanted his wife to go back to the Alexandria community, but Kathy refused to agree. On the way back to the base, the helicopter encountered a storm. Kathy decided to take a gamble. She forcefully grabbed Rick and jumped off the plane. Both of them have a main character privilege surrounding them. They fell into a sea area after they climbed back up. They also found a high-end apartment. This place not only has water and electricity, even the smart housekeeper is functioning properly. Only the table type is covered in a thick layer of dust. Kathy opens the wardrobe and changes out of her consignee uniform. Rick notices a scar on her lower back. The two of them argue endlessly about this escape. During that time, 
Kathy reveals a piece of news. During the bridge explosion incident, she was already pregnant with their second child. The poor little one hasn't seen their father since birth. Kathy reveals this matter, hoping to change Rick's mind. But Rick insists on returning to the Civic Republic military. Rick explains the threat from Jandis. Kathy, however, remains completely calm after hearing it. We can kill Jandis and destroy the prepared documents she made. If it were the previous Rick, he might have agreed to take the risk. But after being trapped in the Civic Republic for all these years, his sharpness has long been worn away. Helplessly, Kathy can only return the communicator. Both unintentionally glance out the window. They realize that it's already bright outside. And yesterday, that helicopter had crashed into the building due to the storm. The Civic Republic military must think they died in the accident. This is truly a heaven-sent opportunity to escape. Little did they know, Rick still wants to return to the Civic Republic military. He wants to carry on Okafor's legacy and fundamentally change the Civic Republic military. Only then can they protect the Alexandria community. Kathy believes Rick shouldn't sacrifice their current life for an unrealistic future security. Kathy wants the couple to solve difficulties together. The Civic Republic military is not Rick's responsibility. Being with his family is his responsibility. The two of them have different opinions. Kathy doesn't want to waste any more words. She found a few handy tools and slammed the door as she left. She wanted to force Rick one last time, but he didn't chase after her. Disappointed, Kathy had to face the zombies alone, just as she was preparing to fight her way out. The Civic Republic military sent a helicopter to destroy the wreckage of the crashed plane. In the second before the explosion, Rick rushed over and shielded his wife. The research building began to crack. The horde of corpses outside also surged in. The couple had to cooperate to survive. During their escape, the two unexpectedly discovered a farewell letter. The deceased's name was Rushmi. He was once a scientist, along with a group of researchers, hoped to create a completely sustainable community through scientific innovation. The reason the building had water and electricity was because of the efforts of these scientists. But the result was tragic. Rushmi couldn't realize his ideals. Instead, he ended his life with a high-voltage shock to his brain. After reading the farewell letter, Kathy couldn't help but provoke Rick. Did you see it? People always want to save the world on their own, but the result often backfires. You stay in the Civic Republic military and work like a horse, which can't eliminate the enemy. This is what I need to do to keep you safe. The only time I feel safe is when I'm with you. The two of them return to the topic of argument. Fortunately, the zombies came and interrupted them. Their most important task is to get away from the horde. Rick and Kathy found weapons, and then they rushed into the encirclement together. The argument just now left them frustrated. The zombies became outlets for their frustration. I had this. I had this. The two of them quickly fought their way out. Little did they know, as they ran to the stairwell, the giant chandelier above them suddenly fell. Kathy got her foot stuck. The horde quickly gathered upon hearing the noise. Kathy wanted Rick to go ahead, but Rick couldn't abandon his wife. They could only fight the zombies while trying to move the chandelier. Fortunately, the couple withstood the test of life and death. They bypassed the zombies inside the building. They circled around and returned to the original room. Only this place hadn't been affected by the explosion. The two of them couldn't contain their emotions and achieved a great harmony of life. After the passion subsided, they finally calmed down and had a good conversation. Kathy talked about the origin of the scar on her lower back. She was pregnant and had a big belly at that time, and she was constantly looking for Rick. Everyone thought Kathy was crazy. Only her old classmate Jocelyn supported her all along and encouraged Kathy to keep searching. But Jocelyn turned out to be a psychologically twisted villain. After gaining Kathy's trust, she actually kidnapped Kathy's children. Kathy fought against Jocelyn to retrieve her daughter. This scar is from that incident. After that incident, Kathy didn't dare to leave her children again. She had to temporarily give up searching for Rick. Until this time, she hit the road again. Kathy also confessed about inhaling poisonous gas, almost dying on the road. She said these things to make Rick understand. I never gave up hope of bringing you home. Kathy looked at her husband's severed hand. She believed Rick had once fought hard to go home, but the opportunity to escape is now. Why is he refusing to leave with her? Just then, Debris suddenly fell from above. Rick wanted to take his wife and leave, but Kathy insisted on resolving the issue of staying or leaving, or she won't go anywhere. Clearly, she was pressuring Rick again. Faced with Kathy's stubbornness, Rick confessed his deep concerns. Carl. <laughs> Rick used to dream about his son frequently, but in the past few years with the Civic Republic military, he gradually forgot what Carl looked like. Rick was truly afraid of losing. He feared his relationship with Kathy would also become unfamiliar. He believed his family's safety could only be achieved by staying away from himself. These words moved Kathy. 
She asked Rick to think carefully. What do you think Carl would want you to do? Finally, Rick finally agreed to go home together. The two of them quickly fought their way out. They found a car. The car had been modified by community scientists. It was a hybrid electric car. There was also ethanol fuel in the back seat. Enough for Rick and Kathy to drive back home. Their journey back home was like a honeymoon trip. There's not much to say about this part. Until they passed by a national park. They unexpectedly saved three weak survivors. They also encountered a type of zombie they had never seen before. Its body was covered in a calcified shell caused by mineral-rich hot streams. But its combat power was undoubtedly the same as regular zombies. Kathy saw the survivors starving. So she kindly shared food with the three of them. Unexpectedly, the chubby man pulled out a weapon. He threatened them to hand over all their supplies. Kathy struck him down with a stick. The chubby man immediately begged for mercy from the two of them. Rick said, as long as you promise, not a scheme against others, I can consider letting you go. The chubby man was puzzled when he heard this. Why should we care about others? In this world, isn't it enough to just save oneself? He didn't believe in the concept of mutual assistance. In the evening, Kathy and Rick drank and chatted. They discussed the attitude of those three people, and the slogan at the entrance of the national park. People come from people, they were engrossed in their conversation. They didn't notice Jandis slowly approaching the cabin. Next, let's talk about the story of this old friend. The time goes back three years. Jandis went alone to the Alexandria community to have a private meeting with her former lover, Gabriel. She didn't disclose the news that Rick was still alive. She couldn't let others know about the existence of the Civic Republic military. Gabriel wouldn't inquire about things Jandis didn't want to talk about. Their conversation was relaxing and healing. Jandis enjoyed the time spent with him. She even missed the time in the community. Gabriel noticed Jandis' hesitation. Gabriel urged her to return to Alexandria, or help the refugees in the community. But Jandis refused. She didn't want Alexandria to get involved with the Civic Republic. She changed the subject and talked about Rick. When Rick was still alive, he had asked Gabriel to officiate his wedding. Coincidentally, Gabriel did find a ring, to serve as Rick and Kathy's wedding ring. But the bridge explosion incident shattered everything. Gabriel decided to give the ring to Jandis, hoping she would keep it as a keepsake. The two of them agreed to meet again next year before parting. In the blink of an eye, a year passed. Jandis arrived on time for the appointment. She spoke about how difficult this past year had been. She kissed Gabriel affectionately. Gabriel advised once again to ask Jandis to return to Alexandria. Since you're living elsewhere in such pain, why won't you come back? The past is already in the past. As long as she's willing to come back, difficulties can be overcome. Little did Gabriel know, Jandis became unusually cold. Because Gabriel's probing disrupted the balance, Jandis was afraid she would truly waver. She would give up her career in the Civic Republic military for love. So she pointed the gun at Gabriel. She wanted to kill her only vulnerability. Gabriel didn't resist. If Jandis could truly kill him mercilessly, she wouldn't have come to meet him for three consecutive years. Jandis couldn't bring herself to do it. Time returns to the present. Jandis woke up and took control of Rick and Kathy. Both of them were curious. How she found them. The reason is actually simple. Jandis didn't believe these two would die without a trace. So she returned to the vicinity of the building to investigate. After seeing the killed zombies, she became even more certain that Rick and Kathy were alive. She followed the traces and found their location. Jandis knew that if she let them escape, they would be discovered by other Civic Republic military, and her identity would be exposed. So she had to kill Rick and Kathy. Jandis could have attacked them while they were asleep, but from her interactions with Gabriel, it can be seen. Jandis still had some compassion. She wanted them to understand before they died, and promised not to disrupt the peace of Alexandria. It's the end of your story. Let that be your peace. Rick flipped over the metal bed. Kathy also charged forward and injured Jandis. She was about to shoot and kill Jandis, but was stopped by Rick. Jandis took the opportunity to jump into a car and escape. Rick and Kathy immediately followed. He explained, we can't kill Jandis. Don't forget, she has a document that contains information about the Alexandria community. Jandis drove the car into a group of zombies, using it as a barrier to stop Rick and Kathy. She covered her wound and fled into the forest. Unexpectedly, she ran into Chubby Man and other two. Jandis claimed to be from a safe community and offered to provide them with shelter. But as an exchange, the Chubby Man had to take Jandis to a safe location several miles away. Rick and Kathy followed the blood trail into a wooden house in the forest. While they were searching around, Chubby Man's group suddenly appeared. It turns out Jandis had used them as bait, intentionally attracting Rick and Kathy's attention. Fortunately, these three were really bad, and Jandis' marksmanship was also incredibly bad. She couldn't even kill the couple while hiding in the dark. But Jandis had that document in her hand. She was certain that Rick and Kathy wouldn't dare to kill her. 
She walked out of cover to prove this point. After another exchange of attacks and defenses, Jandis told Rick, You chose the wrong path. Beale was even planning to show you the squad briefing, but you chose to escape with your wife. You could have ensured Alexandria's security, but you didn't. Jandis told Rick, You have no idea about the Civic Republic military's power. They are the hope of human civilization. We only have two paths ahead of us. Either abandon our humanity and follow the Civic Republic military to save humanity, or preserve our humanity and let the world continue in chaos. And Jandis chose the former. Kathy decided to pretend to agree to go back with Jandis, together, to help build the future with the Civic Republic military, but the other party had to guarantee the safety of Alexandria. Yet, both sides had their own motives in this transaction. They hypocritically came out and negotiated, but simultaneously raised their weapons. Just as the situation reached another deadlock, a zombie lunged and bit Jandis. Jandis said, she had never intended to harm the Alexandria community, but she was truly tired of the taste of failure. That's why Jandis joined the Civic Republic military. She wanted to make something of herself, but now she was about to die soon. Nothing matters anymore. So Jandis revealed the location of the document, asking them to destroy it and hurry back home. The CRM will bring the world back. Tell me you won't come after them. Little did she know, Kathy didn't agree to this request. She had already found trouble with the Civic Republic military. Kathy questioned Jandis. Have you ever considered that the Republic is not the savior? After this incident, Kathy and Rick reached a true agreement. They decided to return to the Civic Republic military together, to find evidence and bring down those hypocrites. But Jandis didn't want to get involved anymore. She took out the ring Gabriel gave her, and handed it over to Rick. Thus, Jandis became the witness to their marriage. In the end, she died by Rick's gun. That year, Gabriel didn't wait for Jandis to keep their appointment. Rick and Kathy immediately return. The two of them decide to split up. Rick goes to check the squad briefing, while Kathy is responsible for destroying the files left by Jadis. Upon returning to the base, Rick goes to see Thorn. He lies, saying the plane encountered an air current, and they crashed into the sea. Kathy died to save him. Thorn didn't suspect Rick. After all, he gave up the chance to escape, and came back on his own. Then Rick asks Thorn if she still wants to. Continue Okafor's plan. Unexpectedly, Thorn has already been brainwashed by the Civic Republic military. She has long forgotten Okafor's words. She only wants to devote herself fully to the current career and help the Civic Republic military build a brand new society. You're meant to be a part of this. It's time to let go of his bullshit. Rick pretends to go along with Thorn's ideas. He says he's willing to become a part of the Civic Republic military. Thorn leads him to see General Beale. Upon learning that Rick has returned to the Civic Republic military, he sets aside his suspicion of him, and promises to let Rick access more crucial information. After entering the office together, Rick hands over his weapons. Beal asks him what is the worst thing he has done, to save someone. Flashes of past killings race through Rick's mind. I killed someone with my teeth. Like they do. Beal says the worst thing I've done, was sacrificing the entire Pittsburgh to save Philadelphia. Not exactly tearing into a person with your canines, but it's not nothing. Isn't that right? Beale suddenly says this. He wants to give Rick a warning. Because of the briefing content, is worse than any situation they've encountered before. The choices they make will be even more brutal. On the other side, disguised as a soldier, Kathy sneaks into Jadis' room quietly. She rummages through drawers and corners, finally finds the desired file in a decoration. Kathy tears it into pieces fiercely then puts the shreds into her pocket and prepares to leave. Unexpectedly, someone comes to deliver a message. Kathy quickly hides behind the door. After dealing with the soldier, she heads to the lobby. She picks up a rabbit doll on the way. The cart next to it is also full of children's toys. Why does a militarized base have these things? Kathy follows a Civic Republic military soldier into a meeting room. The meeting mentions an operation called N1W, which involves a child evacuation agreement. At this time, Kathy and Rick are in different places. Learn about the briefing content. The Civic Republic military recently discovered millions of walkers, coupled with various unresolved resource and disease issues. Internal models predict that humans on this planet have a maximum of 14 years to live. So, the Civic Republic military is planning to execute an extreme plan. They intend to destroy other communities to save Earth's resources. To achieve this goal, the Civic Republic military has planted spies in specific communities, aiming to erode them from within. 
The previous destruction of Omaha was not caused by the walkers, but caused by the Civic Republic military. 18 hours later, the Civic Republic military will destroy Portland to make the Civic Republic the most powerful force in this land. However, the Civic Republic military has devised a child evacuation agreement. Let agents infiltrate Portland's school system to assist in evacuating selected children. Once the operation in Portland commences, 10% of the children in the city will be airlifted out of schools, and then the military will release poisonous gas in that area. During this time, all the airplane portholes will be covered, so the children won't hear or see what happens in Portland, nor experience the trauma of war. Only in this way, once they grow up, can they join the Civic Republic military to continue defending the city. Kathy, hearing halfway through, immediately flees the meeting room, gasping for breath. What's the difference between such a brutal plan and fascism? How to explain the fall of Portland to the public? Beale is also prepared. He will make Portland the next Omaha, by deceiving the masses with the idea of a zombie siege, and then ultimately abolish the council, declare martial law in the city, until the Civic Republic military fully controls the city. After the Alliance partners are destroyed one by one, Beale will advance nationwide. Only in this way can the people of the hidden city survive. I think that the next leader in the next decade that might be you. The reason for Beale's change in attitude is because Rick gave up his freedom and chose to return to the Civic Republic military. Beale greatly admires this awakening. He also tells Rick, as long as you join this grand plan, you can bring your family here to live. No matter which city the elimination plan targets in the future, they won't be in danger. You won't have to endure the pain of losing your son anymore. We will burn things to bring things back. The sword that kills is the sword that brings life. After Beale finishes speaking, he places his hand on the sword and asks Rick to swear upon it. But Beale quickly notices that Rick's expression is off. As Rick grabs the handgun, Rick throws a flying knife. He leaps over the table and tackles Beale. The two of them fight in the office. In the end, Rick stabs through Beale's palm. I never lost my son. I lost myself. My wife brought me back. After Rick finishes speaking, he thrusts the sword into Beale's chest. He contacts Thorn. He claims that Beale went alone to the woods before the operation. Then Rick hides the body in a cart. He pushes the cart into the elevator. Unexpectedly, a soldier approaches. At that moment, Beale's blood starts seeping from the cart. The soldier notices. He knocks Rick out of the elevator. The two engage in a brawl. Rick crawls toward the elevator, but is grabbed by the soldier and repeatedly slammed against the ground. Rick locks onto the soldier's neck and pins him down. He vents his anger. Suddenly, the elevator next to them stops. Fortunately, it's Kathy who has come over. After learning the briefing content, they reach a consensus. They can't just go home like this. They must first stop the Civic Republic military's actions and save Poland. On the other side, Thorn heads to the woods. She discovers that Bill is not here. She suspects that something has changed. She immediately turns back. Thorn enters Rick's dormitory. She notices his prosthetic limb on the windowsill. She realizes that Rick has betrayed them. Meanwhile, Rick and Kathy are connecting a whole box of grenades. This is a method Kathy learned from Nat. They push the grenades towards the armory. Civic Republic military soldiers are gathering outside the tents, preparing for the Portland operation. Kathy and Rick place the grenades around the gas canisters, then secure one end of the fuse onto the zombified Beale, while the other end is tied to the zombie soldier. They lure the zombies in circles and quickly leave the armory. Thorn suddenly blocks their path. She orders them to remove their helmets and return to the armory. No matter what you did, cancel it immediately. If you dare to stop, I'll shoot immediately. As the two zombies walk in opposite directions, the fuse has been pulled up with the grenade pins. At this critical moment, Kathy and Rick quickly rush to the side. They cut the torp and tear apart a water tank cover to hide themselves. Next second. The entire base is enveloped in toxic gas. Dead soldiers immediately turn into zombies. Thorn, wearing a gas mask, escapes unharmed. Rick hears her voice, knowing if they want to leave here today, they must first get past Thorn. He and Kathy quickly rush out from under the torp. Rick disarms Thorn. You destroyed our chance! You destroyed the whole world! As Rick only has a wet cloth over his face, he doesn't waste time talking to Thorn. He just wants to deal with her quickly. Rick throws Thorn to the ground. Unexpectedly, a wave of zombies surrounds them. They surround Rick. Thorn picks up her gun, preparing to ambush. Kathy suddenly rushes out from behind. 
more and more zombies gather around. Thorn breaks free from Kathy's control. Kathy grabs a zombie as a shield, successfully blocking Thorn's bullets. Kathy kicks up a katana and stabs it through Thorn's chest. On the other side, Rick pulls the pin of a grenade and blows up the surrounding horde of corpses. Kathy is startled by the explosion. Fortunately, Rick is unharmed. They rush out of the horde and climb onto a crate. Because of the exposure and failure of the Portland operation, the Civic Republic Military Council votes to overturn the guiding principles of the Civic Republic military that have been in place for over a decade, establishing a mechanism for free movement in the Civic Republic. Citizens can finally move freely in and out. Shortly after, Rick and Kathy return to the Alexandria community, reuniting with their two children. I knew it, Dad. I knew you were still out there. The story of this season ends here. The beginning was very exciting. The plot was tight with a suitable pace. Rick's charisma remains strong. If you like my channel, please subscribe to my channel.